Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Well, we're going to begin a new study today, a study in Paul's epistle, his second epistle, to those in Corinth. And that congregation was made up of both Jew and Gentile. We have studied the first epistle to the Corinthians and now the second. We have seen that that city is comprised of many different types of people. It was a city where people would pass through as they traveled from one place to another. Many Jewish people were there, but unfortunately, Corinth was a very wicked place, a place that focused upon the self, upon the flesh, rather than upon the spirit. And that's why we see that Rav Shul, the Shaliach Paul, that he wrote two long epistles to them in order to encourage them to have a stance, a stance that is based upon truth that overcomes the wickedness, the licentiousness, the sin that was so prevalent then and is so prevalent today. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. Now, one of the things that stands out about this chapter is that Paul is speaking about suffering. And he uses a word, tribulation. We need to realize something. If we're going to be biblically accurate and look at what the Word of God says to believers, faithful believers, we are called to suffer tribulation. Never, ever the wrath of God. God may discipline us, but we will never, if we have received that gospel, if we have that new covenant relationship with God through the blood of Yeshua, we will never experience God's wrath. But realize as we obey God, we submit to God, as we identify as his disciples, we will go through tribulation. That is persecution. But it's very significant, most significant, that, that Paul uses that word, tribulation. We'll see that in a moment. But in the same way that the word tribulation appears several times, you know what word appears more often than that? In the section that we're going to be studying this evening, it is a word that we can translate comfort. God comforts us in the midst of these worldly tribulations, these trials, these afflictions, whose source is the enemy, that one who is in this world and those who are being used by him. So let's begin. We're going to go through this word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and we're going to see the message that God has for us through Paul that first was given to the believers in Corinth. But they're going to be very, very relevant. These words are very relevant for you and me in the epoch of time that we are living in now. Verse 1, Paul, a apostle of Messiah Yeshua, through the will of God, now, the first thing that stands out, Paul does not say the apostle, but the definite article is not there. He simply says, an apostle of Yeshua, the Messiah. And his call is not one that he himself made upon himself, but rather through the will of God. Now, this epistle, 
is not just from him, he's the author, but it's also from Timothy. And here we have something unique. It says, Timothy, the brother. Now, this stands out. We would think that Paul would want to emphasize and make specific his call of being an apostle. But Paul puts himself as one of many apostles in a humble way, even though God used him so mightily. But when it comes to Timothy, we see that Timothy is called the brother. That definite article is there. In other words, what he's sharing with, with us is that Timothy, this young man that came from a mixed marriage, we see that Timothy is a great example of what a brother in the Lord should be. And he writes this to the ecclesia. This word ecclesia, it speaks about those who are called out, called from. And it speaks that we are called out of this world, its way of living and thinking, into the kingdom of God. Now, this word ecclesia, usually translated church. The church of God being in Corinth with all the saints, the ones in all of Acacia. So we see that, that Paul writes primarily for himself and Timothy, but also from those believers, all the saints in Acacia. And he writes, look now at, at verse 2, as he so frequently does, grace to you and peace from God. I've said so often that these two things are, are uniquely connected. Grace leads to peace. And peace is the fulfillment of God's purpose. What that tells us is, is that grace works in the believer's life so that the God's will would be done, that his purposes would be realized. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Messiah Yeshua. Verse 3. Verse 3, Paul speaks and identifies God. We read, the blessed God. Now, not blessed be God. That would be grammatically incorrect. Now, we should say, blessed be God, but in this case, this is not what's said. It's speaking about the blessed God. It is not a call to us to bless God, although we always should. But in this scripture, it tells us that God is blessed in and of himself. He is the blessed God. And that means that he delights. It is his nature to bless that is what God is doing. We see elsewhere in the scripture where, where God is looking to and fro throughout the world, seeking whom he can impart goodness to, to strengthen, to empower, to give insight in order that that one might carry out his purposes. That one might be an instrument of his glory. So look at verse 3 the blessed God and Father of our Lord, Messiah Yeshua. Now, even though God is sovereign, obviously we know that God the Father, God the Son, they are one. Now, that is not in any way moving away from the Trinity. But the one God has revealed himself in three persons. And what I want to say here is when we speak about the Lord, from a new covenant perspective, more often than not, we're speaking about Yeshua, that he is our Lord. And twice we have seen that Paul identifies him in this way, our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. And God, it says here, he's the father of mercies. Now, these are those things in our life that bring comfort. But it's a word here that relates to, to mercy. And what's important to realize is that he's going to speak about this mercy that brings comfort. In fact, we're going to see approximately 10 times 
in these next few verses that the word comfort is going to be spoken of. The God who provides comfort, and it's his comfort that causes us to endure and overcome these tribulations, these suffering. And it shouldn't surprise us because if, and this is really the concept of sense, sense Messiah, his spirit dwells within us. Our lives are hidden in him. His work is done through us. Then we should expect the world to respond now to us as it did to him. And what did the world do? The world hated him and the world persecuted him and he suffered therefore now part of our calling and we don't hear this enough but one of the foundational teachings that should accompany all discipleship is that we have a call to suffer so look at what the scripture says in verse 3 the father of mercies and god the god of all comfort the one who comforts us in all all of our tribulations and not only does he comfort us but the same god he is also able to make us to comfort those who in all tribulation they also are suffering so those in all tribulations through the comfort which he has comforted us by God. So what we see here is simply this. God, he works in my life. And the reason why he works in my life, the reason why he comforts me is so that I can comfort others. And that provides a testimony. It also provides what we could say is a, a manifestation of his truth. God works in a very specific way. All of this confirms his promises. What he's doing now assures us of what he's going to do in the future. So look at this scripture again, middle of verse 3. And God, who is the God of all comfort, the one who comforts us in all of our troubles, all of our tribulation is the word thelipsis, all of our tribulation, in order that we are able to comfort the ones, other ones, in all tribulation through the consolation, the comfort that we ourselves have been comforted by through God. It's from him. Verse 5. Because just as the suffering of Messiah in us, and it's in the plural, the sufferings of Messiah in us abound. And this should be the normal experience of a believer. That the sufferings of Messiah abound in us. This is why it's so important to have a biblical understanding. When we live properly as a true disciple should live we are going to be persecuted we are going to encounter much much tribulation that's why he says all tribulations there's so many different varieties of them but that one god he can provide the comfort the comfort that comforts us through all of them and we do so coming through that other side praising him but notice what he says here we're in verse verse 5 because just as the sufferings of messiah in us abound so through christ and this is what it says the order is so important he says so or just as through christ our comfort also abounds so it is because of messiah that we suffer our relationship, our faith in him, our obedience to him. But what does he do? We share in his sufferings, but as the sufferings abound in a proportional way, so does through him, through Messiah, his comfort abounds. And therefore, we never have to be worried about what we may endure for him. He promises here. And these are words that are so important for this group. 
They are living in a very ungodly place. And their stand for righteousness, their commitment to truth, their different behavior, submitting to the instructions of God, would bring about persecution. Initially mocking perhaps, but as time went on, they were persecuted. But God supplied through Messiah an abounding comfort. Look now to, to verse, verse 6. Since, and here again, this is not a question of if. It's more of a question of when. But we will, as he says here, look at verse 6. But since we are afflicted in behalf of your comfort and salvation. Now, what's he speaking about here? It is because Paul... Timothy and other believers who serve with Paul, who have that same objective, and that is to obey God and be a blessing to others. That's our call, to bless others. How? In every way possible. And God will supply the needs for, that we have in order to be a blessing. So pay attention to this, he says. But since we are afflicted, it is in behalf of your comfort and your salvation. Now here, he's not speaking about, he's talking to believers here. They've already been saved. But here the word salvation is victory. This comfort which causes us to persevere, endure, move forward, and overcome. Overcome in a victorious way. So that's what Paul is revealing here. He's saying, you know, we're suffering. But the fact that we go through it, we receive God's comfort, and we are brought to the other side, this should be a source of assurance for you. It should bring about in your life, in your mind, your understanding of how God works, that he will do the same thing for you. He will provide comfort that leads you to endure and experience victory. And this comfort and this salvation that he gives, this victory, he says, works in the person. How? It produces endurance in that same comfort in the fact that we have suffered. And he says here, we have suffered affliction because of you. Or he says that we have received comfort in behalf of your comfort and your salvation. Meaning this, God's going to work faithfully, regardless of the circumstances. If we are, are experiencing affliction, it's a testimony to you. It works out endurance and perseverance because you see what we're doing. And if it's not that we are experiencing that suffering, but we're getting that comfort now, God through the Holy Spirit is ministering to us. That also is, is a way of teaching you that same principle. So God's faithful, he moves, he keeps his covenantal promises in order that people are encouraged to remain obedient to him. Now let's look at verse, verse 7. The word that appears here is the word hope. And notice here, it's when we endure. The reason why we endure, obviously we're called to endure, but the reason why we do so is that we have a hope. And that hope, because we're committed to, and the hope, biblical hope, is always, write this down, learn this simple principle, biblical hope is always related to the promises of God. It's because I have faith that God keeps his word. His promises will become a reality. That is why I endure, I persevere, I overcome, and in doing that, I know that God's going to supply the comfort, that ability to endure and maintain his purposes and maintain that effort in order that his will is done. So he says in verse 7, also our steadfast hope. That hope does not waver. Why? Because it's rooted in the word of God. The scripture says God does not lie. He cannot lie. So if my hope is rooted in what God has promised me, I can be assured those promises 
I don't know when I will receive them in their fullness, but I will. And therefore, this hope causes me to endure. It's a steadfast hope in behalf of you, knowing that just as you are partners. Now, this steadfast hope is going to also provide a testimony to them. They are going to be partners. Partners in what? Partners in suffering, but also, he says, also in this comfort. And by the way, at the end of verse 7, that's the 10th time we've seen the word for comfort. God giving consolation. Whatever we have lost, whatever we have endured, God will supply. That's what consolation is. He makes up what is lost. You know how God does so? Love this verse from Luke chapter 6. He does so, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. That is the way God gives so that we have a testimony of his abundant consolation, his comfort. So we, as one people, not making a difference who you are, what your background is, he says we are all partners in the suffering and also thus in the consolation. Look now to, to verse 8. For we do not, here again, not just speaking for himself, but for Timothy and all the saints in Acacia, he writes, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, he's talking to believers, in behalf of our tribulation that has come upon us, that's happened to us in Asia. Now, again, we see Paul. Was Paul faithful? Yes, he was. Was Paul obedient to the instructions of the Word of God? Yes, he was. Just read his testimony in the book of Acts when he witnesses before Romans leaders and he testifies that he has been faithful to his fathers, the traditions of the fathers, the Word of God, the laws of God, the commandments of God. He's not turned away from that. And it's that fidelity to the Word of God that's caused Paul to suffer and not just him, but all those who are with him in Asia. And they have been burdened. That is, they have suffered. But it's a word for, for being afflicted greatly. And he says, we have been so burdened down. And notice this word, the word for exceedingly. And in that word for exceedingly is a word beyond, beyond measure, beyond description. And just think, I want you to hear Paul, this man of faith, this one who's had so much experience with God, God moving in his life, supplying for him. Notice what he says. He says, in behalf of our tribulation that has come upon us in Asia, we have been burdened down exceedingly beyond power. Paul says he did not see any power that could deliver him from this suffering, this burden that he was enduring beyond power so that, notice what happened to him, this, this, this man of faith, this, this super apostle. What does he say? He says, so that we despaired, despaired also of life. What does that mean? Paul was despairing that, that he might continue to live. His suffering was so bad, he was wanting instead of life, he would have chose death. He was so full of discouragement, but God taught him something. And this is why this epistle is so magnificent. The principles, the things that we learn from Paul that he shares with us. He says, but, but we ourselves, why was he, he full of despair? The suffering and, he says, we had received upon ourselves the, the verdict of death, meaning the death penalty. But why did this happen? Why did God let this happen to him? that he was sentenced to death, not just him, but others. Why? For serving God. Now, 
you may think that sounds strange, but I assure you of something. It's not that I think this, I know this to be a fact because the Word of God tells it. That we are approaching, approaching soon a time, not just sporadically, not just in certain places, and it's happening already today, but it's going to expand in more and more countries, more and more localities, where walking in faith, being obedient, doing what God calls you to do, is going to bring, just like he says here, bring upon you the death sentence. So when that happens to you, and it might, and it might do so soon, what are you supposed to realize? Notice what he says, second part of verse 9. He says, all of this has happened, why? In order that we would not trust, trust upon ourselves, but upon the God. Not just in religions, not just in, in some dogma, but he says, but upon the God. What God? The God who raises the dead. Now, what I want to talk about for the next few minutes is how significant the term resurrection is. Resurrection is related to victory. It is related to the kingdom. It is related to endurance. When you believe in the resurrection, you will endure, you will persevere, you will seek God's comfort so that you can press forward. That's why Messiah went to the cross. Because he knew, and he says this so frequently, if you are a good student of the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, we see that Yeshua says repeatedly, he says to his disciples, Passover is coming. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be delivered over to the chief priests, the elders, to the Sanhedrin. And they are going to put a death sentence upon me. And they did. And he says, I will be crucified, but on the third day, I will rise from the dead. Now, you know what we learn in the book of Matthew? He said that over and over, emphasizing, but... And this is a word that makes that next part emphatic. But on the third day, I will raise from the dead. How many people believed him? You know what the answer is? Not a one. Not one. No one, no man, no woman, went to the tomb on that first day of the week on what's called in Hebrew, Rashid, this special day of an offering, the first fruit offering. No one, no one, no one went to the tomb expecting him to be risen. They all went there. Who did? The women. To give him a proper burial. They did not believe his promise of the resurrection. And when we do not believe in the promise of the resurrection, we will not walk in faithfulness. We will be like the disciples were. They locked themselves in a room, scared, fearful. Why? No faith in the resurrection. But when we have faith in the resurrection, see, that causes us not to trust in ourselves, but to trust in God, the God, the one and only God, who raises the dead. Verse 10. Who has such, such a great death, death delivered us from? Now, when he speaks about great death, he's not talking about a physical death. He's talking about something greater than just losing your life. That is death, eternal death. That relates to God's judgment. That's what he's delivered us from. So look again at verse 10. He says, who from such a great death he has delivered us and he is delivering us for whom we have hope, that, that deliverance which we have hoped for, and still he will deliver. Now, I need to say something here in verse 10. If you are following a modern translation based upon the Nestle Allen Greek text, it has twice the word for deliverance in the future. But if you follow the Texas Receptus, what the King James, for example, does, 
it points out it has the word, that same word for being delivered. It's a word of literally rescue. In fact, we can think of God as our rescuer. And he has, he is, and he still will rescue us. Rescue us from what? What he says earlier in that 10th verse. Such a great death. Not speaking about a physical death but a spiritual death. That's why Messiah laid down his life so that we could have deliverance, that we could be rescued from that great death, and that is eternal death in the the pit of hell. So it says here, who has delivered us from such a great death and is delivering for which we have hoped that also he will deliver. And what is that related to? That that final resurrection. That's that deliverance that he speaks of, that resurrection that's in the future. Now look at our last verse, verse 11. Now, verse 11 is a difficult, difficult verse to translate. If you take the word of God seriously, you can go, for example, to Bible Hub, and just put in that verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, and immediately 11, or excuse me, 28, 29 verses, different translations of that same verse will appear. And you'll see that, that there is great divergence in, in how to understand this verse. Why? Because the, the Greek is very, very difficult, not so much the words, the vocabulary, but the arrangement and how it should be understood. So we're going to take this last verse, or last verse tonight, very slowly and try to see what he's saying here. Now, to help you, you might want to just write what I'm saying down, these fragments, because I'm doing so in the order they appear in the Greek text, almost without exception. All the English translations, and this is true for other languages as well, they play around with the word order trying to make sense from it. But notice what he's saying here, verse 11. He begins by a very long word. It has a a prefix. It has a a, a connotation of working, helping one another for a common purpose. So he speaks here about, remember the context, delivery. And he says here that because we jointly share in this hope that we should help one another. So helping together, and he's speaking, Paul is speaking about his need of help. And how is he being helped by by these individuals, these people in Corinth and other places? Through two means. Through prayer, we'll see that, and also through gifts. A gift that has been provided by many. Now, we don't know exactly what gift he's referring to. It's the word charisma. Oftentimes, we think of that as spiritual provision. The Holy Spirit provides us so that we can serve. But the context here is not probably referring to that. Why? Look again at verse 11. Helping us together, also you in behalf of us through your prayer, in order that from many, and it's many faces, but it's an idiom, many people. So he says, we have been helped together by you through your prayer, in order that from many people for us, and he speaks about this gift, that this gift, also through many, that what should be the outcome, and this is what Paul's interested in. This is why Paul is committed to the things of God and is willing to endure great tribulation, great suffering, and trust that God will mediate to him his comfort. Because Paul has a hope, and because of that hope, and where does that hope originate from? From God his word, his promises.
So what does Paul want? What is his life motivation? How would you answer that? What is Paul's motivation to his life? Now, many people, they probably one of the most frequent questions I receive is, I don't know what to do with my life, how God wants me to serve him. Well, let me tell you foundationally what God wants you to do. God wants you to act in such a way that your life brings about others to give him thanks. So look for opportunities, behave, do, act in a way that because of what your life is doing, that people give thanks to God. That's what Paul did. And how useful, how successful was Paul? Mightily successful. Amazingly successful. So that's what he says here. In the end of this text, what he's speaking about here is simply how others are, are helping him, working together through prayer in behalf of them in order that many people, through the gift of many, in the end, what would happen? That thanks would be given in behalf of us. He's saying this. There's many people who are providing, who are praying for Paul, praying for Timothy, praying for those who are working with Paul. Many are praying and many have provided a gift, help, assistance, in order that Paul would be able to continue persevere in the things of God, his service. And what Paul is all about in the end, that his life would be a testimony that would bring about Others giving thanks for God. So let me close with this. When people look at you, when they experience what your life is about, are you living, are you behaving, are you doing with your life that which causes others to give thanks for God? That's what being a disciple is, is founded upon. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, Hanukkah Sameach. May God bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.